program. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the virtual program. My name is Archie LaSalle. I'm a photographer, an educator, and an activist. I'm also the founder of Where Are All the Black People At, an organization that works to address the lack of representation of black and brown artists in the permanent collections in our museums and art institutions. I also serve on the board of advisors at the Rose Art Museum. But before I begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge our land statement, which I hope everyone has had a chance to read. Thank you. I'm also grateful to all of you for joining our program, Queer Lens, Photographers in Conversation, co-presented by Where Are All the Black People At, and in partnership with the Photographic Resource Center and the Brandeis Gender and Sexuality Center. I am proud to say that I've taught two of the three talented photographers, Jess T. Dugan and J. Pix Balmer. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Christella Guerra is an award-winning journalist and senior art and culture reporter at WBUR. Before switching to public radio, she was a print reporter for more than a decade, working at the Boston Globe, the News Press in Fort Myers, Florida. Recently, she was one of 24 journalists from around the world selected for the 2024 class of the Neiman Foundation of Journalism at Harvard University. Her coverage last fall on the experiences of Venezuelan migrants locally and as well as at the US-Mexican border received a regional Edward R. Morrow Award. She is driven to understand people's commitment to local journalism and uses art and culture as a lens to delve deep into issues around race, equity, social justice. Please join me in welcoming Christella Guerra. Hi, everybody. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Archie. Um, I'm honored to be here, truly. Um, and thank you to the team at the Roast Art Museum for planning this conversation. Thank you as well to where are all the Black people at, at the Brandeis Gender and Sexuality Center and the Photographic Resource Center. Um, the Photographic Resource Center will host Jess T. Dugan, uh, something to note, as part of their speaker series in April of 2024, so in a year. And JPEX Belmer is a value, valued member of the Photographic Resource Center. We're grateful for their help in promoting this program. Um, they really did share it everywhere. And I'm, I'm hoping that a lot of folks saw it, were able to come and participate with us. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our guests, JPEX Belmer, Jess T. Dugan, and C. Rose Smith. JPEX Belmer is a non-binary Black Indigenous person of color who uses the lens as a tool for storytelling, delving into the subtle intricacies of class, capturing the unconsidered people and places who inhabit the urban landscape while attempting to bring light to the voiceless. Jess T. Dugan is an artist whose work explores issues of identity through photography, video, and writing. Dugan's work has been widely exhibited and is in the permanent collections of over 50 museums throughout the United States. Dugan's monographs include Look at Me Like You Love Me, To Survive on This Shore, Photographs and Interviews with Transgender and Gender Nonconforming Older Adults, and Every Breath We Drew. C. Rose Smith is a visual artist who uses photography and moving images to thread the connections between identity, past and present memories and socio-political landscapes. Smith's recent achievements include the Pre-Picto de la Mode, de la Mode sorry, 
Coup de Curl Award with Leica Camera, the inaugural Silver List of Emerging Photographers, and a finalist for the Aperture Magazine Portfolio Review Prize. Hopefully you had a chance to kind of take in some of the works that we're gonna be discussing. And I'm just so incredibly excited to delve into this conversation. We've had it a few times at this point. Um, what I like to do is make sure people don't feel talked at. So the chat is open. I hope that you all will discuss sort of what we're talking about. We'll en you'll engage with us, you know, ask us your questions. We, we have some time. Um, I think that there's a lot to talk about, especially at this moment in history. So what I was hoping to start off with is um, kind of a heady idea, but situating bodies in time um, or history. So this idea of, um, you know, the past being prologue to a certain extent. And Rose, we, when we talked about this, I asked you specifically about, about using black and white and positioning yourself in these places um, and what that meant to you to be not, not just on that landscape, but included. Um, could you kind of delve into that specifically? It was the, um, oh, forgive me, uh, your scenes of self readdressing patriarchy, which I really, really love. Um, and also your face is so, um, I, I don't know, it looks to me in that moment, you look like you are in the past and simultaneously you look like you could belong in the present at the same time. Yeah, certainly. Thank you for that, Christella. And, and thank you to Archie and where all the black people at and Brandeis University, the Rose Art Museum um, for organizing this panel um, to go ahead and jump right in, Christella. Yeah, so, I think given this moment in history, I think in particular um, with the ban on critical race theory, right, in, in at least 18 plus states um, across the country, I think that, you know, my work is very timely. Um, and I think in terms of situating my body, my, my being in these particular landscapes, right, um, looking at the past as also the present, like the past alighting with the present and being able to, to return to this particular history, return to these particular landscapes, being from the South, the Southeastern part of the United States and thinking about um, the ways in which identity is constructed, also the ways in which um, Forgive me, I'm like articulate, like trying to to articulate my thoughts. Um, but more specifically, I think just being able to um, bring my ancestors with me into these spaces and um, understand that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Give me a moment. No, no, take your time. Yeah, yeah. Um, because it's really it's a really deep history. And I and I think for me, it's being from the southeastern part of the United States and returning um to these landscapes over and over again and understanding that um in particular the the aristocracy or high society, the elitists of the 19th century, white white elite, a white elite society of the 19th century you know, built their fortunes on chattel slavery or through chattel slavery. And so um, for me, it's being able to, to come to these spaces and confront this particular history and to understand what this means, what this meant in the past um, and what this means in the present and the ways in which these spaces, um, although they, a lot of them are, are excuse me, were, um, you know, um, historicized, um, you know, mansions, uh, uh, antebellum mansions in the South um, or plantation mansions, if you will. Um, but I think in particular um, for me, it's just being able to be present and, and understand that I'm bringing my ancestors with me to be able to confront this particular history um, and return the gaze um, to, to the camera. Um, well, that's, I keep thinking about the looks on your face. Like what I couldn't stop looking at was your presence. Mm -hmm. um, what were you thinking about when you would take the picture, specifically in the white shirt, which I know you emphasize as this symbol of so much, um, especially power in these places? And and for folks who don't know, where were you specifically? Where were these these mansions located? 
Yeah, yeah. So a, a lot of my work deals with researching um, wealthy wealthy merchants just across the South. So merchants who were uh, merchants of trade who were invested in cotton, um, uh, sugarcane, tobacco, rice, et cetera. Um, so, you know, going to Louisiana, different parts of Louisiana, um, going to um, Georgia, different parts of Georgia, um, Alabama, Mississippi, South Carolina. Um, and so, yeah, just being able to to have access to these spaces in the contemporary. Um, and for me, it's, you know, it's interesting in thinking about, you know, what these what these plantation mansions and how they how they function in the past. Uh, of course, it's like, you know, thinking about, you know, enslaved people were um, were dehumanized in these spaces. Um, there is a a violent, you know, an inconspicuous violent um, history that is that is past, of course, but that is still present and that and that is still looming in these spaces. And so, for me, it's being able to think about, you know, when I enter these spaces, what that means, you know, and I and I, you know, start to ground myself and donning these white cotton dress shirts and these garments that you know are symbols of patriarchy, power, um, white supremacy, masculinity, respectability, politics, and professionalism, um, being able to don these garments and again, you know, return my gaze to the camera, again, just bringing, you know, the, the it's sort of like a call and response of feeling like my ancestors have called me to, to come to these spaces and to assert my presence and to be present and to know that I and them are, are present together, right? Rose, thank you. That's so powerful. Um, I'm going to move into, it's interesting when I was looking at each of your websites, you each had a phrase that you used to describe your practice that I found intriguing. And so I'll mention them at, at points. JPEX, the one that caught me was when you say, um, what does it mean to capture, it's, you said capture the visual soul of the Black, queer, and unseen. What does that look like in your work? Oh, um, I think you're muted. Thank you, Christella. Yeah. Thank you for that question. And um, it's a pleasure to be here too. Um, that question, capturing the visual soul of the Black, queer, and unseen includes, I think Black people, um, another quote is, you know, from Du Bois, Black people um, forever striving forward. Um, I hope to capture people in their essence. Visual soul to me is what's inside, something that you can feel from the outside. Before it's even there, you might see it and the pictures have an essence that speaks to you. And so I think that's a, a form of visual communication, right? And that's what I mean by helping people communicate through their soul with photography or through the power of photography that we can um formulate together. And in that process, are you building, um, there was discussion around like an archive, um, something of a legacy that you're all leaving. Um, so your work basically outlives you. What is what does that archive look like in, in your practice, JP? Archives. Well, I think the beginning um, is very interesting of an archive. I wasn't thinking about an archive. Um, I think I was thinking about um, how to be considered and valued and be seen. And um, while doing that, I used myself. Um, I think that was all I had left, I felt. And well, that self-portrait allowed me to be considered, allowed me to show my skills and my talents and to also say, aha, I can do this for other people because this is working for me. This is something that, uh, it was an answer, I would say, um, to opening up without saying anything. And so um, this allowed uh, me to engage with folks around photography and really um, show them the power of that. And so um, with the self, I began to use my skills with portrait photography to then showcase the visual soul of other folks saying, you got it too, um, let me show you. Because, you know, people uh, were not communicating with me in a friendly manner. 
It was uh, judgmental and untransparent. So I think in order to get close to someone, um, which I wanted to do desperately because I thought that in order to, uh, to get to know each other, we had to see each other. And we had to really see each other in a, in a great way, in a likeness that we saw that was uh, compatible that we could work in and delve into. And so photography for me, um, again, started with self, but has transcended into the legacy of the people um, with me, again, offering my skills and talents to show their skills and talents. And this is a collaborational effort, which allows us to uh, speak to people in ways that we didn't imagine we can, right? And to open up in ways where it allows us to insert ourselves and position ourselves in ways that we knew that we can, but people didn't realize that we were already there. And so this is what the legacy is beginning to become, uh, the strength of the people, the self-insertion, uh, the voice of the people, right? And um, we're building the archive to celebrate our stories because our stories and our expression really matters in order for us to learn from each other and to move forward and get through it. So that's what the archive is beginning to formulate. And so this timeline here with self-portraiture kind of uh, displays the effort towards self-realization and also um, towards being confident in your pursuit of who you are going to be and seeing yourself and your greatness right in front of you. I think in each of your work, what I see is a certain level of a uh, agency, you know, like it, it's it's taking it's it's taking a full sort of a, a not just a collaborative effort with community, but then like um, how did you put it, JPEG sort of um, and and Rose, you too, sort of insisting that you know we as queer folks have always been here and we have a right not just to exist but to be remembered. Um, Indeed. Just, um, I was hoping we could get into what we had basically talked about just before, which was this idea of storytelling at a moment in history, like now what Rose mentioned of um, what are people trying to erase and what then is even more important to capture? Um, you know, what have you, you know, as, as we're watching, you know, the, the world and, and the country legislate our lives without our consent, um, you know, what's what's on your mind? Um, and, and, and could you talk to me about your practice? Sure, yeah. Thank you for that question, Christella. And I just wanna echo the thank yous to everyone who made this program possible. I'm really honored to be here and I'm already moved by the, the conversation so far. So thank you, Rose and JPix. Um, yeah, my work as an artist has always come from and been really informed by my own identity and my place in the world. It's the way that I understand myself. It's the way that I interact with others. It's the way that I build community. And I've always moved between a highly subjective personal telling of my story and more of an outward looking documentary approach working within queer communities and trans communities. I've always been really invested in the importance of representation and particularly representation of queer lives and queer bodies and queer experiences and thinking about the importance of having those representations exist both in a museum space and in the culture at large. And I think right now, one thing that's really strong on my mind is the importance of storytelling as an artist, the importance of um, creating space for other people by sharing your own story, of creating empathy and understanding, and thinking about how to tell stories around queerness that go beyond simply its existence, which of course is important. Um, but how do we go beyond that? How do we talk about all of the complexities of a lived life from a gaze of queerness and also all of the other elements that inform each of our identity, but not have it be simply saying, this is who we are, we exist. Um, and this moment is so complicated because I really thought we would not be here right now. I thought we would be <laughs> in a different place. And so in some ways that assertion of existence is actually feeling really critical again. Um, but as an artist and as a creative person, I'm really interested in, um, getting more complex and talking about relationships and intimacy and community and all of the complexities of living a life and family and parenthood and psychology and all of these things 
through a, a specific angle of a lived experience. Would you tell me about, in this case, the phrase that really, that really caught me was look at me like you love me. Where did that, what, what's the, what's the, what are the roots of that? Um, sure, yeah, so, um, so first of all, I've always been terrible at titles and I usually steal them from song lyrics. So this is the first project title that, that was actually mine. Um, that's the title of my most recent body of work and publication that really looks at all of the things I was just talking about, intimacy, connection with others. It's really about this idea of personhood. What does it mean to be a person? What does it mean to be in relationship? What does it mean to be beholden to others? What does it mean to live a meaningful life? Um, and so my book of photographs is interspersed with narrative texts that I wrote um, that were about my own experiences, certain memories of photographs, reflections on my own life, reflection on, reflections on why I photograph, why I'm compelled to make images. Um, and one of these texts says, look at me like you love me, I say. And this came from language that I would use when I was photographing my partner. It was something I would say to kind of elicit a certain expression. Um, and when I excerpted it for the book title, I feel like it took on a new meaning and could be read in multiple directions. It could be read like the subject is saying that, you know, asking for a loving gaze from a viewer. It could be interpreted that I'm saying that as the photographer, I want to be looked at in a certain way by the subject. And then it could also be interpreted that it's coming from the viewer, like they want to be the recipient of a loving gaze. So I'm really interested in this uh, multi-directional interpretation. And one thing that's really important in my work is the importance of seeing and being seen and how the act of seeing and the act of bearing yourself and letting yourself be fully seen can be so meaningful and validating around identity. Um, and so that's really the, that's really the core of, of that work. I love that. Thank you. Um, this is a question for the group. Um, also, we have 49 attendees and I know that they have questions. There's no way that they lack curiosity if you're spending your Thursday evening on a panel about, uh, you know, queerness in photography and queer photographers in general. So I'm, I'm ideally hoping that in the next seven minutes, you'll give me some questions because I really want to, I want to discuss and engage in this subject that I know that we all find fascinating. But, um, when did you first see yourself? You know, did did that exist? Was that in an exhibit in a, in a photo that you saw? Or did you take it? Which which I think often, you know, happens to be the case. I mean, I I have images of myself in a very different time when I was extremely closeted. Um, and I am absolutely the same person. And I'm not. And so it it's interesting how it just, it took so much overcoming shame in my case to come out, um, not just as someone who's a storyteller, but as someone who tells stories of people that she identifies with. Um, and, and in turn, those lived experiences allow me to capture stories better to me, you know, but it took years to be able to acknowledge that that informs my work. So when was the first time you saw yourself or was it a photo that you took yourself? I would say um, for me, the first time I saw myself was my mom. Uh, my mom took us for a lot of family photos or just photos for ourselves, uh, like modeling for like Jamboree, I remember. And it was always just a really nice photo, but dressed up really nice. And um, this was me and my brother. And so I think um, just really presenting ourselves really well and showing uh, you know, a proud family and um, us looking good, that was something that my mom showed us. And so when I look at those images, uh, you know, all dressed up, I feel good. I'm like, wow, my mom paid for this. You know, she wanted this for us and she valued the way we took care of ourselves and the way we presented ourselves. So um, that's, I would say, the first time I actually saw myself um, you know, other than my grandma I'm always having a Kodak camera and taking photos at every family occasion. Um, and then me again in 2014 doing that self portrait. 
Yeah, I would say that's a good question, Christella. I would say um, I think I see myself more so now than I have ever in the past. Um, and I think it's just being able to to when I began the journey of making self-portraits, <clears throat> excuse me, in the height of the, the pandemic in 2020, um, I was really grappling with my identity. Um, I was really grappling just kind of back and forth about, you know, why do I have to ascribe to race, class and gender um, and understanding you know, this social construction of identity and how confining um, it is for me. Um, and so I think after, you know, go, moving through the process of making self-portraits um, at home in 2020 and then coming out and making the work that I'm making now, um, I think more clearly I'm able to to understand that I can be both and, you know, I don't have to ascribe to, to one thing. Um, I'm human, you know, and that's something that I really start to lean into um, is, is not, you know, I know that we ask each other what our pronouns are, but um, ultimately I'm, I'm a human being. And I think that um, it's just being able to understand my fluidity, understand too, that I appreciate this idea of being a dandy. Um, you know, like I said, both and masculine and feminine and understanding that those are expressions and not genders. Um, and so that's something that I'm, I'm really leaning into now. I love that, Rose, thank you. And actually I'm gonna follow up with a question after after this on a phrase I saw in your bio, but but just you, do you, did you want to offer something? Oh, sure, is that okay? Yeah. Oh, please. I was gonna say, this is actually kind of a sweet question for me to answer on this call because Archie is here, who knew me when I was, you know, in my teens. And um, my mom and her partner, Chris, are tuning in tonight, which is also extra sweet. So I have audience who witnessed this moment, but, you know, for me, I came out when I was 13 in the late nineties and, it feels like that was a very different time. And, and there were not a lot of representations of queerness around me at the time. And I had a really powerful early experience when I was around 15, 16, discovering the work of Catherine Opie. I would go after school to the Harvard bookstore and just browse through all the photography books. And I, I was in search of identity. I was in search of something that looked like me. And I found the work of Catherine Opie. And it really, for me, let me know that I was part of a larger community. It gave an imagery to how I felt and was incredibly powerful validating my identity. Um, and I was already very masculine presenting as a young person, but it was just something about seeing these images out in the world was really important. And so I think about that a lot now. I think about the lineage of artists that I'm part of and, and, and trying to pass along that experience of recognition for, for others. Thank you so much for that. Um, we are getting many questions and I'm very happy about it. Thank you, everybody. Um, Rose, what 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 really uh, kind of piqued my interest was the question, are we kind of a man or mankind? Which goes along with exactly what you were just talking about, about being human. Um, is that something, would you, would you kind of unpack that with me? Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, and that still resonates, you know, even right now in this moment is, you know, again, just being able to understand what humanity looks like and being able to to know that um, that no that no one is separate. You know what I mean? Like none of our existences are separate. Like yeah, we have our own being, our own ways of being, and yes, yeah, sure, we have differences um, that we you know we can celebrate that are very unique. Um, but I think more than anything, there is just this thread between all of us that connects us and that is humanity. And I think that that is something that I really focus on and I bring into my work um, more so thought wise um, when I approach my making. And so it really is just about recentering our humanity um, in all things, right? And becoming more, more human um, each and every day, right? So that's where I am with that. I really, really like this question. Um, and then I'm gonna actually read Somebody didn't have a question, he had a comment, but uh, the comment was, I honor the allies who made space for me to grow into my gay manhood. I'm grateful for my queer senior friends who created the space in society for me to be out and proud. I'm grateful for each of you as photographers for continuing to make space for me and my community to be seen, known, and heard, which is the essence of what it means to use art to make space for us to be. Thank you, Archie and our dear friend, um, Al for using our photography for me to have space to be all of me, which I think is just, you know, really beautiful, especially during Pride. And then the following question that was from Noah McIntyre, but Frederick, um, forgive me for Caffarella asked, how did you start photographing yourself 
in such a vulnerable way. I would love to, but I struggle with self-image issues. So I think, yeah, a question for the group. I can jump in and tackle that. I love that question. Um, you know, I've always made self-portraits and I think at various times they have felt more more or less vulnerable, depending on what I'm thinking about or what I'm experiencing in that moment. And I would say for me, the act of photographing myself has been a way to visualize my body and to understand what I'm going through in any given moment. And also to, I love this word archive, which I know we could go down that rabbit hole intensely, especially thinking about Lyle's work and queer communities and all of those things. But thinking about self-portraiture also as creating your own archive of your own life and capturing who you are at different moments. Um, but one thing I would say in, in directly to the feeling of worry or finding it difficult is that one thing I've really found over the last 20 years is that by creating portraits of myself that have often felt very vulnerable when I'm making them. Sometimes they feel less so by the time I'm putting them out in the world. And I feel like that, that gap of time is sometimes really critical. But by putting these images out in the world, I have found that the response from other people is incredibly healing, actually, and incredibly validating. And I found that by making myself vulnerable, it's created space for other people to be vulnerable with me and to be just really seen in the fullness of who I am. So I have found in my practice, the things that often feel the most vulnerable, the most intimate, the scariest to make public are then the things that I feel like can resonate deeply. And the act of, the act of sharing those things for me has been its own kind of healing, separate from the act of healing that comes from the making. Thank you for that. Thank you, Jess. I'd like to add to that. I love the yeah. idea of also documenting your, your own timeline and your own growth and your own evolution. Um, and also photograph because maybe you have something to say. Photograph because you want to express yourself and maybe in a creative way. I think for me, it's about experimentation. And so if you want to experiment with you, you're the best person to do it with. And to be alone and to be vulnerable and to have an expression, right, without saying anything, can say a lot to you when you look at it and also can say a lot to someone else who never thought about you. So I think um, it's all about you, right? It's all about what you want to say and how you want to creatively show a little bit of yourself and maybe your talents. So for me, I think that was that was it, right? Um, how could we use this tool? Because we have many tools. Um, how can we use this tool uh, to describe a powerful us and a powerful being, a powerful soul? And um, I think it's all up to you and you experimenting with you. Yeah, I think that that's a powerful statement, and I'll uh, underscore that point of ex you know experimentation, exploration, and examination of self. I know for me in particular, um, like in the height of the pandemic, um, <clears throat> while everyone was in lockdown, I really, I just, I, I felt like I was just doing sort of like radical acts with with myself and with my identity. I shaved my head, um, and then I remember coming back from the barbershop and, you know, putting on um, suit like just suits and just sort of like dressing up and dressing down and, um, you know, just looking at myself in the mirror, do this. And I had a, I would mount a mirror on my door um, and also put up my camera. And so being able to see myself in the mirror um, in terms of representation, to see myself the way that I wanted to see myself, the way that I saw myself in the mirror is how I wanted to reflect seeing myself in the camera. Um, and it's really just about, you know, dismantling some of the you know insecurities or ideas or like you know growing up as a kid like people will make fun of you and like point out stuff that is nonsensical um you know just to kind of sort of you know sort of kind of make you feel different and, and um you know like you're abstract or abnormal and I, and I think for me it was really being able to to see myself face on um and embrace you know what I see embrace this beauty um, that I saw before myself reflected in the in the mirror and in the camera. And I think that that's something that I really wanted to frame. Um, and I fell in love with that um, and being able to 
to just move through different poses. And um, I have very, I'm a very hairy person. I have hairy legs, hairy arms. And so that's something that I, I saw very crisp, um, you know, show up in the camera. And I, again, like I fell in love with that and just being able to see myself again, just as human. And, and that's just what carried me forward. And that's where I am, where I am now. So, yeah. There's this question in the Q&A, which I'll jump between the chat and the q and is totally aligned with what we're discussing. Um, it's from Claudia Friedel, and uh, she asked, I am curious about the role of ritual in your processes. So question for all of you, but specifically Rose thinking of ritual and its relationship to the white shirt. For all, how does ritual hold space for stories? Additionally, how do you add and or subtract from said ritual? Interesting. Yeah, that's a really, that's a really, uh, <laughs> Rich question. Um, I think for me with the work that I'm doing now, um, the ritual is is meditative. It's being able to, to, to don these garments. And I think it's sort of like habit and ritual at the same time of like feeling my way through buttoning the garment um, and unbuttoning the garment and standing before the camera to assert myself, assert my presence, assert my gaze, my being. Um, but I think it's it's also grounding myself. I stand barefoot um, more often than not in, in all of my self-portraits. And so the ritual is being able to ground myself in these particular um, violent histories that again are inconspicuous unseen um, in these in these landscapes. And so being able to take that on and bear witness and allow my viewers to bear witness with me is something that is very meditative. I get excited about. Um, and so I think that that has become my ritual. Yeah. Others? I would say um, the ritual for me has always been um, really reverent the people, right? I think everything is about a celebration, a celebration of the mind, the, the thoughts, and the heart. Um, the photography for me is about the ritual of connection, right? Being able to share with each other um, transparently and honestly. Um, I think that allows us to really see each other. Um, the ritual for me is asking the question, who are you really? And uh, being able to say that and also um, grow out of what you think you are and grow into something new, uh, resembling your next level. Um, those are rituals that I bring to the table to help us grow. Um, to help us feel together and like we belong. And no matter what, like we will, con we will forever begin to continue um, the greatness that we share and that you hold as an individual. And so um, the ritual again is um, identifying the assets and celebrating the people um, always and forever. I think that that excites me, uh, it really does. People excite me when they like themselves and when they feel good about who they are. I really like that. I love that what you just said about when people feel good about who they are. I feel that in my work too, for sure. And just in my life. But, you know, I think for me, the the ritual, perhaps in the most significant way is just the act of making portraits. It's really a rhythm that defines my life. It's something I do regularly. It's a kind of connection with another person that I really need as a, as a human, as well as an artist. Um, but the other thing that comes to mind is two other things is place and moving my body. Um, I have a ritual of walking in a park near my house. And that's actually, it's a big part of my life, but it's, it's become a part of my practice. It's where I think it's where I ground myself. Um, and also thinking about place, places that I return to, for example, Provincetown on the Cape is a place I've spent a lot of time and made a lot of pictures. And there's something about going back to this place over and over and making pictures in the same water in the same sand in the same location year after year after year that that is important to me there are at least three questions that ask very similar things as in people really want to know what influenced your work uh, one is phrased uh what is one idea that was the most influential and influ influenced your work today um and someone else asked uh, what advice do you have for young queer creatives who are trying to find their voice? Uh, what are some things you watch out for? Uh, what, where did you find inspiration? I would like to say that 
a lot of inspiration for me comes from the idea of telling stories. Um, so all of my projects and all my works have acronyms so that I can dig and dig deep into what they mean, their truths, and how we can expand and go beyond and look beyond, right? Um, what we're actually doing. And so um, I think that I forgot the question, I think, but I also want to just say, um, yeah, a lot of my work has to do with acronyms and storytelling. And that's how I kind of move along through that work. That totally answered it. What was the, the question in again? Influences. What influenced you? Uh, and where do you find inspiration, especially for a, a young queer creative who's looking for inspiration and for their own voice? Okay, I, I find inspiration from other people from people who, who I admire, who I'm inspired by. Um, a lot of my findings come from going there to know there. So I, I like to talk to people. I like to make connection. I like to engage. And so um, I do it because I want you to do it back. And if you don't, you know, I'm gonna do it. So I think it's a, it's a connection. It's an exchange of energy that just keeps on going. And that's where a lot of the, the, the work comes from. Um, a lot of synergy and connection with people and places and spaces. Yeah, I would say for me, a lot of my inspiration and I guess influence comes from, like I'm really fascinated um, and maybe sort of obsessed with um, just portraiture, traditional portraiture painting. Like I'm really interested in, um, like if you go to the Museum of Fine Arts Boston um, and, you know, go through the, I guess, the art of the America's wing. I'm really interested in traditional portraiture and the ways in which, you know, the the white elite would frame themselves, you know, um, whether it's through statues, again, traditional portraiture painting, um, even I think in photography through looking at daguerreotypes and tintypes and ambrotypes of sitters, you know, um, uh, portraying these uh, mannerisms of, of, of power. And I think that that's something that really, um, influences the way that I see myself and that I think through the way the, the ways in which I think through you know the ways I want to frame myself um, and sort of taking up agency autonomy um, you know being an authoritarian and being able to dictate this is what this is who I am this is what I am this is what I'm bringing with me this is who I'm bringing with me like I'm an entity you know all together again with my ancestors and um this is what I'm presenting before the camera, but those are those are in particular are my influences and inspiration and looking at art history and the ways in which I think too black people have been um, portrayed, um, you know, in positions of servitude. <clears throat> and so being able to, you know, foreground us um, <clears throat> in my self portraits is being able to foreground myself and again foreground um, the presence of of my ancestors with me um, in in my portraits, and so that's something that I'm very um, intentional about when I when I make. I love that you mentioned art history, Rose, because I take a lot of influence from that as well. And I have a background in the museum world, and just love walking around, looking at all the paintings and gestures and poses, and thinking about who was represented and who was not represented, and how to respond to that in this moment. Um, I think more broadly, a lot of the inspiration for my work just comes from my life and the, the lives of those around me. I've always worked within my own communities and um, really set out to visualize experiences that I saw around me, but I didn't see in imagery. Um, so a lot of it is just from, from lived experience. During the pandemic, I was really inspired by music, especially you know, singer, songwriter, storytelling kind of music. I'm doing a lot of reading and writing right now, creative writing. Um, so I kind of pull things in from everywhere. I remember one of my professors in, in college read us a poem that was basically saying, look around you, bring everything in, put it to use, like everything can go into your work. Um, I did want to hit on the question for advice for young creatives and especially queer creatives. I think my biggest advice would be one, you know, to find your own voice and follow your own work. Um, I think the most important thing for an artist is to just keep making work. I think it's not an easy task. The world doesn't make it easy. Our world doesn't overly value the creative process. So I think if you find your own rhythm to keep making your work over a long period of time, that that is that is it, that is the goal. Um, 
I also think it's really important to build community and have people around you that support you and likewise for you to support other creative folks. I feel like that's especially important within queer communities and for queer creative folks. It's just really essential. And being an artist is a long game and it can be solitary and difficult and lonely. And you've got to have your people. You've got to have your own network outside of the market or shows or galleries or any of that. Um, I think that's really important. And then, you know, I would just say specifically maybe to young queer folks is that to emphasize like following your own voice, because there are ways in which certain exhibitions or the media might try to reduce your work down to being something that it's that it's that's overly simplified or it might try to put you in a certain frame or pigeonhole you in a certain way based on your identity and so i think it's even more important for young queer folks to just follow the work follow the work and follow their voice and don't feel like you have to make work that neatly fits in a box or that you have to make work about your identity or you have to make work about queerness. I think you've got to just follow your own life and your own work as an artist. Thank you for that. Um, that I question was from, I oh, please, say, yeah. That one other thing that's influenced the work um, a lot has been the voiceless and people who are unseen. Uh, I think there's so much talent near me and in Boston and we kind of overlook it. And so that's what really um, gives me the fire is people who are just judged and overlooked and unseen. And so um, being a help or being of service to people really um, really brings joy to me in, in photographing um, and influences the work a whole lot because I think that we all need help in identifying ourselves and getting something that we want out. And so I see that as, 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 as an agency as well and something that influences the work a great deal um, because I like to say no judgment and until you get to know someone, um, you know, you'll never know until you get to know someone. And so that's what influences the work, really getting, getting to know people and, and building community too. So thank you Jess for um, bringing that up. And for also for the young queers and people who are like me, I would say definitely believe in yourself and have faith. Um, know that you can free yourself within your creativity and with your voice and your personal story. And so um, just keep believing in yourself and find others that you can uh, talk to, um, find people that you can talk to and that you like and you admire. And so I think that's important. Thank you. I'm very, very pleased with the questions. Thank you, everybody. And it's maintained, we're at like 40, it's between 49 and 51 people who stuck with us. Um, and I honestly wish you could be here for another two hours because I have like, you know, 15 more questions I could get to. Um, so Jessica Burko from the Photographic Resource Center actually asked, um, that she's wondering how you feel your work fits into contemporary art discourse. In this moment in history, do you see your work as being embraced? Do you see your work as, uh, your work is seen as other. How do you feel your work is being included and embraced by the arts community as a whole? I'll go and I'll say um, for the work that I create now, I think uh, as a timeline, these self portraits are very important. And this shows um, kind of a person like myself building a uh, self identity and um, self invention and also um, calling agency to myself to be represented through other people. Um, I think that um, in itself is a part of history, um, being a black photographer, a black queer uh, photographer. And so um, just being a part of history in terms of archiving our legacy and celebrating our people who have done so much in the past that haven't been recognized yet is, um, is a big part of how we should be included in our storytelling and our identity, um, our, our, our identities that are visible in institutional spaces and outside institutional spaces that really bring value to the authenticity of the, our communities and our environments. So I really think being, being in contemporary art places and museum will allow people to open their minds and consider the things that are right in front of them even more because um, this is about love indeed.
Yeah, and I think to that point, um, I think just in contemporary art, I think it's, you know, Nina Simone said, um, you know, it's a, the work, the role of an artist is to reflect the time. And I think even Tony K. Bambara, um, who's an activist and writer, scholar, um, African-American feminist, um, she talked about the role of an artist is to, um, to for, for our work to be irresistible, um, right? And, and I think that with that in mind, for me, um, within contemporary art and being able to reflect the time to grapple with some of the social issues that are going on and to make self-portraits and to create representation, to make ourselves visible, to make Blackness and queerness visible, I think that it's extremely significant in this moment. I mean, I think about like the what I just expressed in terms of my influences and inspirations, you know, walking through the Art of America's wing and seeing the ways in which, you know, um, white people have made themselves visible and, you know, assert their power and their presence. And so, you know, why not us do the same thing? Why not myself do the same thing? And why not my work be acquired um, and be put in these spaces and be in conversation um, or offered as a critique of what is on view, um, you know, presented by, um, you know, these, these um, again, wealthy white elitists um, in, in society from the 19th century, 18th century, 19th century, early 20th century, and, and again, to, to, to now. So that's something that I, I really think deeply about. Thanks for this question, Jessica. I think it's a big one. And I think we could talk about this for a long time. Um, you know, I've worked a lot with museums over the past 15 years or so, and I am really grateful that I've found a lot of support for my work. And I've found a lot of um, genuine support, people really wanting to bring, you know, representations of queerness into the collection, wanting to use it for teaching, wanting to display it. And so I'm incredibly grateful for the support I have received. I'm aware that the previous generation had a much harder time than I have had in terms of getting critical recognition. And I'm aware of that all the time and grateful for a lot of the work that people did all of that having been said, I still think we're in a moment where the, the access is obviously not equal. There are limits. There are ways in which as queer or trans people, we're always put in a certain lane or brought out at a certain time of year, as we're all familiar with. Um, and I won't share any names, but I recently had an experience where I was promoting my work to a museum and I was accidentally copied on an internal message. And someone said, oh, this work is nice, but I like all these other non-binary artists better. And they listed all these other artists. And I looked at all their work and our work had nothing in common, you know? And it, so I wrote back to the museum and I said, I assume you didn't mean to include me on this, but since you did, I would respectfully ask you not to reduce my work to my identity. And they immediately apologized and, you know, backpedaled. But that, so that's happening. That's happening behind the scenes. And when would a museum ever say, oh, this project is beautiful, but we already have these other pictures by white men. Like that doesn't happen, you know? So I think we're still, even with all the progress we've made, you know, queer people, people of color, women artists, unfortunately still, we're all like not quite given the same assumption of, of, of quality, of universal artistry. It's, it's, there's still ways where I feel like we have a lot of work to do, even as I'm aware of how far we've come and, and the progress that we have made. I, I really like a panel with some tea. Um, I respect you not telling us what museum it was, but that, that, is, that is something. Wow, how absolutely reductive and sad. Um, I'm hoping, I'm gonna, we're at 7.54, um, and I think we've gotten through a lot of the questions. I want to have each of you give your final thoughts uh, but there is a really solid question in the Q&A around what direction you see, uh, what direction are you looking forward to see your work go? So future, future thinking. Um, I love the idea of uh, always imagining ourselves in the future, 50 years, 100 years, 500 years. Um, in the past, it always felt like, it was almost like you were looking for Easter eggs of queerness in photography. Like we have all these photos from certain eras where people are like, they were definitely definitely in a relationship, but it was so dangerous at different decades and points that you could never really, you could never know unless it was obvious and said. So I'd like to think uh, both through the work, the brilliant work that you all are doing through the archival work, through the legacy work, through the immortality, 
that was previously built by wealth by writing names on buildings and investment in the arts. Um, I, I think there's no way that the future will, will not have us in it, regardless of how history moves. You know, I also may have like 50,000 photos of myself and my partner and my cat. So at some point, people will see these images of, you know, our queer ass life, I'd like to think. So what are, what are your final thoughts? I would say um, for me, thank you, Celeste. And uh, thank you everyone for being here today. My final thoughts are to do you and believe in yourself and um, find your, your gifts, right? Whatever that may be. Uh, you might meet someone that can photograph you just the way you like, right? And that might, that might be something you really like to do too. I think, um, this is an honor for me because I've never thought of my work being looked at in such a timeline or even considered. Um, it's a, a, a pivot for me in terms of seeing myself, right? Um, because I always do a no face, no place because I think people are very judgmental and they don't know you until they know you. So I like to get people real close. And so I just would say, um, you got to go there to know there. Keep finding people that inspire you and that you um, want to learn from. And um, don't be afraid to go get close to them. And um, um, thank you again. This is something that I've never dreamt of doing. And I was very honored to be able to talk about the work. And I continue to be able to talk about the work in an archival way, building with communities, creating legacy, uh, visually being able to create uh, a destiny for us, right? To actually articulate the vision we want in our communities. That's important for me. What do we want to see? Um, what do we want to be surrounded by? And what spaces can we create in being for each other? Uh, that's where I see all of this good conversation going and these ideas being able to build up and actually be invested in because we have to invest in the people, right? People. And so um, that's that's a goal for me is to get people invested in, get the assets valued and um, authenticity wins everywhere. So thank you again. Yeah, thank you for the question. And um, I think, you know, where I am is I really just like I'm, I'm really passionate about the idea of dismantling this white Western canon uh, within the history of photography and being able to have a more complete history of photography, uh, right, where we are represented, everybody's represented, where we are telling our stories, our truths um, and and asserting them. And I think it's being able to name ourselves and claim ourselves, um, again, with agency, autonomy, um, being author author authoritative. Um, and I think for my work in particular and it moving forward, I think it's being, you know, a part of the conversation in the contemporary about what's happening now, um, right? And how my work um, reflects a bit of what's happening now. Um, and, it's, and, it's, and it is subversive, um, but it's still on par with what's happening now um, and being able to engage in with professors um, teaching the history of photography um, or teaching art history and being able to talk about artists who are of the contemporary, you know, it's like the contemporary is now, it's not, you know, 50 years ago. You know, we continue to talk about some of the same photographers from 50 years ago and we call them contemporary photographers or contemporary artists. So I think it's being able to give light, to shed light to photographers who are creating now, emerging early career photographers who are creating now. Um, and include them in the conversation and include them in the classroom um, to, to again, dismantle this canon um, and to broaden the curriculum because there's so much art, there's so much work, there's so, ma there's so, so many photographs that were made even in the pandemic that we have you know, no knowledge of right now. So I'm really interested and invested in um, you know, the, the, the moments in the future that we'll be able to like actually understand how many images were made, like how many photographers were actually making self-portraits in the pandemic um, and how many photographers are still making self-portraits right now. Right. And so that's something that um, 
that I'm that I'm looking forward to and just continuing the conversation about representation and making ourselves visible and being able to to know that again we are one like we are we are one we're human um and that's what humanity looks like is being able to know that there's no separation so that's those, those are my final thoughts I love what you said, Christella, about your pictures of you and your partner and your cat and asserting that you were here and that people will see those pictures. And I think for me, I'm just really excited about continuing that effort. And part of why I have worked with museums so much is I want those images to be preserved. I want them to be seen. I want them to be in dialogue with other work. I want young queer people to encounter them in a museum and have that experience. And I feel really strongly about that. Um, I think for me in my personal practice right now, I'm still thinking a lot about storytelling and how to tell my own story beyond the limits of photography. So I'm working more with video and writing. And one part of that is making work about family. I'm a parent and making work about being a queer parent and a non-binary parent and this larger depiction of family that I at least have not seen much. I'm really interested in basically continuing to tell my own story in pursuit of creating the representations that I don't see around me. Thank you all of you for this just wonderful discussion, Archie. Thank you so much for, for allowing this to happen. Thank you, thank everyone. What a, what a panel. I am truly honored. I feel extremely blessed to know that the future is alive and well with all kinds of photographers out there making art. And I'm, I'm glad to be a part of all of your lives, you know? And um, I think about that next generation and the generation behind you. We're all standing on some very strong shoulders. And I know the shoulders of the people that will be standing on yours rather will be really proud uh, of the work that you're doing. And thank you. Thank you so very much. Mm. Wow. Thank you, Archie. Thank you, Christelle. Thank you, Rose. everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jake, you do that. Thank See you, Rose. Rose. And I believe that there is a virtual program on June 22nd. Uh, it's called Queer Bodies, Queer Souls, the virtual pride tour uh, to celebrate pride month um, and hear diverse perspectives on gender, sexuality and identity um, in the work of LGBTQ artists in the permanent collection of the Rose Art Museum. So hopefully you will end your pride month with us. Although as far as I'm concerned, pride is 365 days a year. Thanks everyone. Absolutely. Ciao.